guys watching Game of Thrones yet? Where are you at? Where are you at with the Game of Thrones deal? You finished the whole fucking... I haven't even finished season 5 yet. No, you just went non-stop marathon style. Yeah. Oh, what? What? Isn't there usually like 10? Is there something missing? It finishes like pretty like, okay, what? Don't tell me, don't tell me. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> okay, okay, that sounds about right. Okay, I got it. Right, right. That's why I kind of wait. By the time I'm done, they're doing the like, the next season in the theater and I can watch it. It's, if I hold out long enough, you know? So I try and hold out, but I don't know if this time it's right next door. I might just watch it. So they finished season seven. No, that means that now we can watch it. <laughs> but we want to watch five first, don't we? Refresh? No, come on. I can't remember. I'm, I'm, uh, it's so poignant. We could get it, but let's wait. Let's what? Put on, put on five though. Get off that other stupid game. If you want to watch violence, let's make it some intriguing, theatrically based, metaphorically semi-relevant, cutthroat, Machiavellian violence. <laughs> I don't know. Gosh, do I want to just show you what the the, the worst that it's supposed to be like, or do you know, rainbows and unicorns? It's a very hard choice. A little bit of both. Kitty Koo is a really nice one. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's already like he's already seen it, so I'm going at this point. Well, let's watch together and see how you interact and make commentary and stuff. But like, he's already watched the show, so you know when your child gets to be a certain age and they become young adults responsible to a certain degree you want to be aware of what's going on I mean he I don't have him listen to NPR except on the way to school <laughs> you know indigenous programs and I listen to Catholic or Christian programs or just different talk shows basically pundits economic commentary political and then I'll just check him out and while he's in here and see how he responds like you know and he's really yeah, well informed I mean you think a 14 year old would be like oh you don't have any access to information but they do they have the meat they have the internet they have access to everything they just don't look as much because they don't care like we don't care <laughs> we're like big kids in that way I guess because we don't really want to be searching up NBC to check a, a, a story we don't care what they're saying because we know that they're paid entertainment propaganda now so we're like okay yeah maybe that's what I'm used to my grandma like watches it or my mom maybe my mom doesn't watch that shit come on seriously come on now <laughs> you know that generation was already like hip the 60s kids were like fuck that we're gonna go start communes in the mountains and we're gonna like teach finger painting and, and, and be with nature and learn about how to like live in the wild sustainable living and grow food or just find out about upcoming albums or just fun things in their life of um I don't know, getting a new house or, or things like that. And um, that's something that we try and do too, is, is just bring some of the life that goes into these songs that we get to play for you and, and hearing some of these journeys as well as hearing what people feel when some of this music hits their ears. Uh, I know I've given you a lot of info in different places. And you can also go to Indigenous Foundation on Facebook and I have uh, retweeted or, or reshared or posted however you talk about Facebook posts. You can find it there, all of these different events that are going on, uh, links to musicians and, and, and things that they are thinking about. And okay. so um, we'll continue. If there anything else pops up that doesn't make it on the list today, I'll... From indigenous, right? Which means people who were here, maybe living in tents, roving, you know, peace in the land, like, you know, fight each other, but, like, environmentally, there was no poisons, there was no toxins. Now, these people were in the same lands where their ancestors were buried, and their 
people for thousands and thousands of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, whatever, you know, like if it was a graveyard that you lived in of all your ancestors, and some people moved in and were like, we're just going to dig up your ancestors and put them all there, and they did it all over the country, then you're like, uh, could you guys not do that? And they're like, no, we gave these other people permission to do it. They own us, we're actually, we work for them. But we don't want to, but and we don't want it to happen, but it's happening because they own us and you can't stop them. According to the bylaws, the technical, it's a, it's a paperwork thing. So we're going to just pollute your river with lead now. Sorry, nothing you can do. It's just out of our hands. Yeah, these people that have been subject to this for hundreds of years, and that's the nice, insidious stuff now, modern, that they can't get away with the stuff they used to do. It's just like, fuck you. <laughs> We're going to just kill you and take your shit. Not everybody. Santa Fe and New Mexico and Taos and, you know, the Navajo populations and the Diné and there's Apache up here. And I mean, there's a lot of different groups. I mean, of, uh, of indigenous population, people who have pueblos. And they were thriving and have been for a long time, on and off. I mean, it's still res life. It's still <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's a lot of it's social. You're trying to be balanced between how do I maintain my great-grandfather's values, right? The way that we lived for a thousand years in a new economy where I don't have a choice about what is offered to me. And now I can't run around in the forest and just get dinner. You know, people will sue me or like take me to a court or, you know, shoot me or, you know, different stuff. You got to be careful. It's a weird world out there now, different rules. So, but you still want to honor your traditions, right? So a lot of these tribes, these these groups, families, I think is a more appropriate. It's like the Spanish families. There are the Spanish families who came from Spain and established homesteads and did trade with the local other people who were in the areas, if there were any people. Some of them warred and fought over resources and because, I mean, their style of living was different. So there's some negotiations that had to happen where people would just move into your neighborhood. Like, But, you know, they've had some really horrendous, violent exchanges and also some really amazing, I think, adaptations that have occurred where you see the culture of the Spanish and the culture of the native populations integrating in a way where someone didn't have to kill everybody from the other one or put them in a jail. Federal definitely implemented a lot of different types of segregational aspects that were not there before. Because from the crown, you got to understand there's a transition. These were independent lords and ladies on lands that they rightfully own and came before the government from Britain came in and said, well, but we want to have a peace. So you have to pay taxes to us. And they said, okay, but these are our lands. We're already here. You can't just come and claim our lands. They said, how about the Indians? Can we take their lands? We're going to take the Indians' lands. Because they're Indians. They don't count. They're not humans. They're savages. They're not Christian people. They don't count. Come on. You're Christians. We're Christians. Help us to dominate these people. And they're like, no. (laughs) We actually have been living peacefully with these people who are our neighbors for like hundreds of years already. Why are we going to fuck that up for some stranger who's going to come out offering us like, what? You're going to give us money? What are you going to do? Move in? And then we have you as a neighbor and we got to like figure your shit out. Fuck you, dude. Get out. No, you can't come in. (laughs) And (laughs) at this point, I'm told that the the locals posse'd up and we're like, nobody comes in. If you want to leave, fine. But don't be traveling around and getting on our lands and stealing our cattle and trying to move in. We, you just came in with an army a second ago talking about we're going to take over and we're going to rape and pillage and take your Indian lands and kill everybody and take their shit. And we said no. And then we negotiated. But that negotiation, I think, was a different state-federal relationship negotiation treaty than most Because what they try and do is transplant. Because if you have transplants, then you can basically mitigate no land ownership. Nobody has rights to land. So therefore, I should mitigate all rights to the land as a sovereign entity that's not going to have special interests in mind. Is the That's the line. 
that the loan shark gives you, right? No, man, there's no, you gotta pay nothing back. I'm just here, you know, to help you out. Out of your own money. Out of your land ownership rights. Already done. So, here it seems like that worked quite differently. There's still like economic pressures that are put into place to kind of keep forcing families to, you know, you have more kids, the, the land splits up, the, everybody wants to sell at a certain point, the, the, the houses are not maintained well. Over 70 years, 100 years, grandma dies, great-grandma dies, suddenly people are moving out. You know, it gets, it's an interesting thing to watch and, and to kind of think about. The dissolution of the family center where everybody can go and be safe and you have a house if you ever need one suddenly becomes this every man for himself now ideally that becomes you know five people leave the, the nest three people stay and maintain the nest and like the five that go out start new nests that are sustainable and then if someone in the first nest gets you know grandma gets old and tired and you know maybe it's ideal that she's out with aunt aunt gracie over in uh out in the woods where they have the little farm thing going on and it's nice and quiet and away from the city and she's already got two kids so grandma can hang out with the kids you see that's the that's the ideal that we were sold but what's happening is instead we keep having to move and move and move to get jobs right to maintain just the basics the kids move out and want to have freedom because they're strictured not by us as much by schools and how those relationships happen, those environments work, and these kind of things, you know, paradigms. If you're going to be working, you're going to be working. you got to support yourself. So they're like, okay, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. They get out. They get out there. They're like, okay, now i got to support a whole household by myself. And for 10 years, I can't. And then I get maybe to partially even where I, you know, I put into my home. I've got a job that I can count on that I kind of like, that I can tolerate, that's not the worst job in the world. A lot of different ways to go, I guess, depending on what you have as your base um, roll of the die D&D characteristics, right? Maybe your character comes from a family that has lots of money, and that's never been an issue, and they have good jobs and governmental positions or some kind of, they work in the prison industry, they work in the government, they work in... Uh, medical industry, and they make enough money to make a good, comfortable living, pay rent, but they're really haggard, and they're overworked, and they're kind of disillusioned, because the type of work they're doing is a little bit soul-killing. And when I say soul-killing, what I mean is, like, you can get some measure of, like, soul fulfillment out of what you do, based upon how integrated it is with your ethical principles, and um, what you love. And, I mean, if it's something that you like, you could get, okay, I like people, you know what I mean, in general, so I can be a cashier and enjoy being a cashier. And it's not really about the cashiering. I'm just, maybe I'll optimize that skill. But the, the what makes it viable is that I'm talking to people. But take out the people, and I'm just at a cashier, and it's silent. And people come through, beep, 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 beep. Give me about 10 minutes, and I'm done, dude. I quit. So there's a human component in these jobs that is getting fulfilled. And I feel like the way they're structured, we don't ever get enough, really because it's always a little stilted with profit motive. Somebody's trying to make money, so we kind of have to jip you a little bit, even when we're not trying to most of the time. You know, I have to get my percentage, and I only get my percentage off the percentage that my boss gets, so I got to at least jip you 15%, because that's my pay. On top of my wage or whatever, as a salesperson, or as a, a fundraiser for the Sierra Club. What's the difference? Uh, selling you different stuff. Still on paper. Probably more on paper in the Sierra Club, which means more trees that are killed. Then, with the salesperson who's got shit in his suitcase. So that's a more sustainable job, ethically, than raising money for the Sierra Club, in some ways. There is, then you could argue, well, the funding that goes into lobbying makes a difference to some degree in this legislation and fighting legislation that's going to destroy our forests or, you know, pollute our things. It doesn't seem like that's really doing its job. They're still polluting. They're still doing the laws. Lobbying's not, not the way anymore. We have to figure out a way to reroute that money. I know that you've already got that behemoth called the Sierra Club and all these other profit action groups that basically have to glean money from us that, you know, should be going to feeding our children. 
and take that money and then repurpose it so that it can be made into a big mace and you can like swing it at a, a congressperson, you know what I mean, who has an invisible shield around them made of money where our stuff just deflects off. Anyway. I just, we just paid $700,000 in lobbying to a dude this year. One dude, that's just one. There's many, many, many for each special interest. Special. This is a special interest now. Like, whether or not we have clean drinking water is a special interest. It's not like a, a standard right, human right, according to our laws. Now, that's the significant part of that kind of shit, is that now we have these laws that mitigate who gets to do what. It started with the natives, and they're like, well, you don't count as human, the blacks. No, you don't count as human, Africans. You don't count, you're non-Christian, you don't count as human. So we can kill you, we can rope you up, and you don't have the same rights, and, and you can't defend yourself in court, basically. Now, that's changed. So now we can all go to court, but the courts have been made into something that is so arbitrary, arbitrarily legislative and bureaucratic that just to say, hey, I want to defend myself, is made so complicated that not a single person does it, like three a year. If they have a lawyer do it, I'm saying without a lawyer, no one does it. It's so complicated on purpose. But it's just bureaucracy. It's not, you know what I mean? If it's going to be justice that we're like trying to work on, we have to have this conversation where we address the efficacy of these programs and these processes to see are they really serving their function? And if not, we need to get rid of them and replace them with something that works better, right? Oh, now everybody with a job is like, oh, shit, well, fuck you, TJ, I don't want to lose my job. Well, just we'll make a different job. You get the next one in the next thing that's just structured better. So who gets to frame the structure? This is the manager to some degree, but not really. A lot of it's precedent-based. It's just how it's always been. So the problem is not that we need to vote somebody into place that's going to do the changes right. The problem is that whoever gets voted into place is voted into a system that already works a certain way and to make any minute change is a huge, huge issue. It's difficult. You're moving a lot of weight. There's 700,000 bylaws that go along with that already. So are you going to add one? Are you going to take one away? So I'm thinking probably rather than adding one to 700,000, we take away a whole like class of like when we do the uh, legalizing marijuana federally, that kind of action is, that's a real action. Suddenly, we've made a cultural change akin to going from techno Japan to techno Japan fused with Denmark and Amsterdam. Now, if we want to do that with our already varied and, and, and magical background, base that we have with all the people here because that's what this place makes it special is that we got paid people from everywhere I'm not ever I don't think we should ever deny people coming to America if they want to come personally come make it do your best I think it should be an even playing field for everyone but that also means that when you come in you should leave your money at the door and start from zero like everybody else you know and but then that would be unfair to the people because the people who lived here already and had resources yeah see Maybe limit the amount you come come with. I don't know, man. There's some. I'm trying to think of how we can maintain something that's not exclusionary, and it kind of puts everybody on the same level. In terms of you don't have very rich people having a huge advantage when they want to immigrate into a place over people who maybe are just as intelligent or more more or more valuable in terms of their skill base and skill set. Which I know we have some standards already, but like right now, I'd say we want to do special like looking for people who know sustainable energy systems and have been implementing them in Europe. Duh. Has anybody been implementing this? Why not? Because we don't have any leadership. So I don't know. Maybe we need to get some new leadership. Real leadership. And I guess maybe that has to start at home, huh? I guess the point of all these rants for me is me working through these processes to see what conclusions I come to. And I'm just putting on the camera so I can witness my own process and then listen to it later. If you see this, these are all opinions and it's me kind of theoretically thinking about this and this and this and this. None of this has any, like, I'm not attached to any of my own ideas. I don't consider them to be my own. 
I'm exploring ideas that are out there that have dynamics already in the systems, political, economic, and I'm observing the systems, and then I'm considering, hmm, what are the implications of this mechanism in this system on this other system, like this economic mechanism on um, social relationships in families and in, in community and with neighbors. When we put money in the process, how does that change things? Our relationships and how we see each other and how we relate. You know what I'm saying? So that's been a process for me is like exploring that and then recording it and then I, I listen to it. I might put this on YouTube or something at some point. So if I do, don't take it the wrong way. I'm not, I don't know. This is just me processing as a normal, regular human and trying to think about these ideas. And I'm not stuck to any of them, but I'm curious to hear if you have responses that aren't just, fuck you, you're an idiot, you you have a stupid idea. But like substantive, like I listened to what you said, and I, when you were in minute 23, you mentioned this, this thing about... Uh, you know, um, sovereignty rights or whatever. And, and on that subject, you know, this is my ideas on it. Cause I think that you approached it from this vantage, but you don't take into account that for X demographic, these situations exist, which make this and that more, uh, possible or more difficult to do, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, I think it'd be cool if we could start dialogues on these issues online where we can maintain a dialogue and it's not just trolling. I'll try and block any troll people, but the idea is that we're generative and we figure out solutions to these ideas that are, that are coming up because we're all in this together at this point, regardless of our personal agendas. Everybody wants to eat. Everybody wants to have a fucking house. Everybody wants their kids to go to school and get away, you know, for a little bit so we can do our thing or have our kids at home so we can, like, engage with them and teach them whatever. But you know what I mean? Like, the point of all this is that we're working out what works and we need to have experimental groups, I think, that go out into little communities and be like, okay, let's try this and that. Because the issues aren't going to be technological right now. Later, they will be technological after oil, if we have any problems with oil, fossil fuels. You know, and we're already, obviously, throwing bombs into a places to make sure we get this stuff. So we're already at critical red murder range of, like, eh, eh, we should probably not be investing in this thing. It causes crazy, horrible, you know war, invasion, bombing, killing, espionage stuff. So maybe we shouldn't invest. It's like investing in tar heroin, literally. Yeah, ever think about that? Yeah, but it's real. It is, that's what it is. It's kind of like the metaphoric same as it would be for an individual to do heroin. That's our relationship with gasoline and fossil fuels. Um, it's ironic that it has the same substance to, to it. Um, so given that, if we're going to try and address these issues, we got to first look at what our addictions are, what are our reliances, and then look at how we can maybe recraft our culture so that we have other ways of doing the same things and meeting our same needs that are less taxing. And then we create plants in our communities where we create these things en masse. A lot of different ones have think shops where we think about it and then we experiment different people can anybody in the community can participate we got autocad we've got laser cutters we've got um 3d printers like that we can then if we have an idea on that level escape and scale where we're going to make a prototype we could just go talk to meow wolf talk to the makerspace talk to these different organizations we already have but have a coordinated group of people where we're doing these we're supporting this kind of process if we want to be forward thinking as a community, and I'm thinking in terms of just where I live in Santa Fe, we need to have these types of coordinations, not just in schools, because they have biases to support their own school and intellectual property rights and funders and a board of directors and all that stuff gets in the way. What we're trying to do is have an open, free forum where people who have good ideas get get not so much funding. We don't want it to be about money, but support in terms of access to tools and resources. Then we only need one workshop. Exactly. Everybody can use the same workshop. Because if you have one, then everybody can do use that one resource. So like if you have one truck, for example, as my you know, friend just went by, if you got one truck, that truck can serve the needs of 25 people. You see what I'm saying? If you need be. There are different scales and scopes of kind of community reference and, and, and uh, relevance, like uh, value, valuability or something, you know. 
But um, taking that into account, I think, is, is very important. And so when it comes to jobs, we want to find the value of a job before we start investing a bunch of our money in just jobs in general. It's construction. Yeah, that, that worked in the last paradigm. Construction, we could rely on that as a way to pay a bunch of people to do some shit that needed to be done. And now it's toxic. It's not the best way to do things. I mean, if we're going to be doing it, we're relying on fossil fuels. If they get expensive, this gets expensive. we got to look into, okay, what are we going to do about this? Like these changes that are happening, how are we addressing each one? sustainability with with not if we let pge be the ones to implement the new electric system we're fucked they're gonna do it to benefit themselves they they're scrambling to get it done now they've been doing it for 30 years non-stop they're very good at it if we want to have some kind of autonomy as a community we need to have our own provisions set up in the laws the local laws before they come in and start really changing stuff so that we make our rights sovereign because we are sovereign landowners and as long as we don't mess with the grid the grid should not be able to mess with us because that takes away our autonomy as landowners in a functional manner so we don't want to do that to ourselves it would be stupid the only people to suffer are us so we want maybe regulation in terms of anything dangerous possible but other than that make your system see if it works the less you tax our main grid the less we rely on coal powered energy production the less we rely on nuclear power energy production that's always good the less we rely on those things is always good for us as a community and the more we do it the better right if anybody has any um can say different break it down tell me how why is it such a great idea to invest time and energy in trying to figure out whether or not we should shift our energy dependence why would you want to argue for dependence on basically tar heroin black tar heroin war causing um, profit for people who do not live in the community that are usually humongous corporations or individual families that are already empires you know so they got to maintain a whole empire now how stressful is that on one person let's break that up a little bit so we got small empires for everybody where we all have our own little homesteads and and we can choose how we grow them instead of one person owning 70 of them condo associations and mitigations and management it's like prisons instead of homesteads you know so i don't know given that i'm basically thinking about uh, this as this is all a proposal or advocation um for an idea which is that we have a a group, a, a group entity, maybe a nonprofit, maybe a not for profit. And what the point of the entity is that we sit together, we discuss ideas, and then we implement these ideas and experiment with alternative energy systems. With but that, that can be then manufactured on a scale that is inexpensive enough to be affordable by most people and then also implementable by a normal person that doesn't have special technical knowledge but can you know can have access to a hammer and a screwdriver and do that kind of thing right and basic electronics knowledge or whatnot and figure out how to make these things more available to people so that we can maintain our own local grid systems without having to rely on a huge grid of regulated energy that basically pumps money out of us on a regular basis on purpose and needs to to thrive instead of feeding it more by integrating our energy systems with their codes and their meters and their whole deal where they get to kind of fuck with us legislatively and own us in our energy production to a certain degree they own like the batteries and stuff you know they're trying to do different ways of doing it and when they do figure out how to do it and make sure it's profitable the board of directors will force implementation at any cost because it will make them so much money so we need to do it first you see and make sure we're already off the grid. We have laws that protect us to remain off the grid, the electronics grid. And then manufacture the units that we invent that are capable of producing the energy um, that we need to sustain a basic existence with cooking and, you know, refrigeration, probably. All right, just an idea. <laughs> Excellent.